Good morning. God bless each and every one of you today. If God rings in your heart today, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. What a wonderful response. Today is a wonderful day. Um, uh, you know, our hearts go out for Sherry, and, and uh, we want to continue to pray for her. But soon, I believe, she'll be home in heaven with the one that she loves, the one that she lived for, and what a day that will be for her. Amen? We just love the Lord today. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. <laughs> for, it really seems like there's not very many of us today. I don't know why. I guess we, there's a lot of people missing. I want to remind some of the people who are probably watching this on Facebook, Diana and Steve and Roxana, you know, I'm, I'm still praying for you, and I'm hoping that we will see you here in church soon. Um, uh, as soon as this COVID ends, and uh, we praise the Lord. This week was a was a wonderful week. Uh, like I told you last week, I was leaving town to go to the district board of ministries meeting, and basically what we do there is we decide who's going to be ordained this year into the Church of the Nazarene. And um, uh, I had a personal interest in being there because this week, last week. LaDonna went for her final uh, interview to be ordained, and she was 100% unanimously elected to ordination. In April, she'll be ordained on either the 22nd or the 23rd of April. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing, amen? Let's give her a hand, all right? Uh, I know it should probably embarrass her, but do you clap for ordination? I don't know, but I want to tell you something. From someone who went through all the hoops to get ordained in the Church of the Nazarene, it, it requires a lot of work and a lot of dedication, and she's done a fine job, and she's earned it. And I, and I for one, am very proud of her. We, we just, um, uh, it's wonderful that we can have two pastors here on staff. And Adana is, is a our worship pastor, and she's in charge of visitation, and she does so much more, and she's a blessing to me, and um, uh, she doesn't know it yet. Don't tell her. She's going to be a blessing in a week or two when I'm going to have her preach, okay? <laughs> oh, she just said, oh. Anyway, I love you today. I want you to know that I love each one of you, and that I pray for each one of you, and um, uh, it's my pleasure to be your pastor. Uh, to share the Word of God with you. And, and my aim is always to encourage you to be the best that you can be for the Lord. I want you to live a life that brings God glory, and I want to encourage you to, as today's sermon is named, I want to urge you to aim for perfection. Perfection. Or aiming for perfection. Philippians 3, 10 through 14 is our scripture text today, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I believe that each one of you want to be the best Christian that you can be. Amen? I mean, who wouldn't want to be the best Christian they can be? In fact, who wouldn't want to be the best they could be at anything that they try hard to do? I believe that you want to be all you can be for God, and that is good. That is a great thing. In the last Week sermon, I told you that as long as we live, we will never be perfect. We will not reach complete perfection until we get to heaven. But even though that we can't be perfect, we should still always aim for perfection. Now, here in the Church of the Nazarene, and most of you probably know this, we believe in entire sanctification. And uh, we believe that Jesus can make our desires perfect, our heart perfect, that he can change us so much on the inside that we have his will, that his desires become our desires. Now, I'm not saying that's easy, but that's what we believe. And I believe it is possible. I believe that we can have the desires of Christ. As we know him, the better we know him, the more we will desire to be like Jesus. For the Christian, the goal is to be as Christ-like as possible. Philippians 3, 10 through 14 says, Paul says, I want to know Christ, yet to know the power of his resurrection 
and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. That's the second time he said that. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What an amazing... Uh, there's probably eight, there's four sermons right in the very first verse. He says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, participating in his suffering, becoming like him in death. That's three sermons right there because they're all different. What Paul was really saying is he wants to know Christ. In verse 10, when he, when, when he says, I want to know Christ in verse 10, what he is saying is, in this whole couple of paragraphs, is that I am aiming at perfection. Paul knows that Jesus is the example set by God. He is God, and to know him is to understand what perfection is and what God desires. Amen? We, we can't know God outside of knowing Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just impossible. If we was to take all the information that Jesus gave us in his holy word and that he gave us when he was here in life and we took that and threw it out the window and said, it doesn't exist, we would know very little about God or what he desires. Paul says in verse 14, because of this, he says, I want to be like Christ, participating in his sufferings. That's participating in his life. Jesus, I want you to know something. Since the moment Jesus died, he has never suffered one bit. Amen? Now, he suffered a lot dying. But since he died, he's been glorified and he's been in heaven and he's not suffering. So if you're going to participate in Christ's sufferings, you have to participate in his life. That's what, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I, go, I want to participate in Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus in his life. And then he says, and in his death. And when he says in his death, I don't think he's saying, well, I hope I get cross crucified between two thieves on the cross. I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's saying, I want to be crucified just like Jesus. I think he's saying, I want to become like Jesus in the fact that he gave his all to his father, his life, everything. He sacrificed everything to be and do his father's will. He sacrificed it all to fulfill his father's will. You remember Jesus said, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, may it be so. But not my will, but your will be done. That's what Paul is saying. He says, I want to be like Jesus even to the point of death. And then he says, most of all, I want to be like him in his resurrection. You know, everybody gets resurrected. Everyone who ever lived will one day be resurrected. But not everybody will be resurrected the way Jesus was. Jesus was resurrected onto eternal life in heaven with God the Father. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, I want to be resurrected. I want to know your resurrection. I want to be resurrected to eternal life with God the Father in heaven. Well, that's, that, that, that's a lofty goal, isn't it? it? To be like Jesus, to be like him in his life, to be like him in his death, and to be like him in his resurrection. But that is every one of our goals. If your goal is not to want to be like Jesus in his resurrection, you're in the wrong house today. <laughs> because this is all about getting to heaven. Today I want to give you seven ways to press towards the goal and become like Christ and aim at perfection. And they're... they're Five of them are real easy to do. Couple of them, maybe not so easy, but they're the right thing to do. First, we need to become healers. Almost everybody, or I believe everybody, can be classified as either a healer or a herder. Herter, you hurt someone. And there are far too many herders in the world today. 
Some people use guns and knives, while other, others use hateful words to hurt those around them. What some people say makes things better, and what other people say make things worse. Amen? You know people like that. In fact, you know, we had a president who wasn't exactly a healer. And, and I'm not saying anything bad about Donald Trump. I, I, I actually thought he was a pretty good president. But his words hurt. We can heal with our words or we can heal with our words. Or we can hurt with our words. Proverbs 12.25 says that anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Everyone knows that what we say makes a difference. I used to tell my teens and all my youth groups that a word is like a bullet, and once you pull that trigger, you cannot bring it back. And sometimes words wound people for life. I can remember counseling teens who their fathers or their mothers or their teachers or their coaches had said things to them, and they just couldn't get past it. Not only can we heal with our words, but we can heal with our actions. The parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke 10 is a very case in point. It's rather disappointing that we refer to the Samaritan as the Good Samaritan. Wouldn't it be so much better if his behavior were normal instead of considered good? Wouldn't it be better if everybody was like the normal good Samaritan and we just called him the Samaritan or the normal Samaritan? That all people would be the kind of person that the good Samaritan was. Jesus was trying to explain how we should treat one another, how we should treat our neighbors. And, and, and remember that in this the neighbor was a Samaritan who the Jews hated and looked down on and would walk across the street just so they wouldn't have to walk next to him. That's where Jesus says our neighbor is. So he talked about a man, a Samaritan, who was beaten, robbed, and left for dead beside the road. And, three, and the three people who wandered into his life afterwards. The first one was a priest. Well, wasn't that a good thing? Wasn't that fortunate? Here comes the priest. And we all know the priest is going to help, right? Everybody knows a priest would stop and help. But no, he didn't want to get involved. Do you suppose that he might have been running late for church? Or maybe that he had a board meeting to attend? Maybe he should have asked himself, what would Jesus do? But being a priest, he should have known what Jesus would have him to do. But he just crossed the road and passed the man by. Then the Levite came along. Levites worked in the temple assisting the priests. Now, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. They knew God's word. They should have been one of the first people to do the right thing. Perhaps he felt he just didn't have enough time for this. I mean, after all... <laughs> It wasn't his fault the guy was laying there. He didn't mug him and, and steal his money and left him for dead. Besides, no one would know. There was no one else out there, so he just passed by too. Oh, yeah, God would know, wouldn't he? Then the Samaritan came along. And remember, the Samaritans were the bottom of the social totem pole. To Jewish people, Samaritans were about as bad as you could be. They were people who married outside the Jewish faith. They were a mixed breed. They were the ones who had disobeyed God's commands. And they just did not like them. No Jew would have helped a Samaritan if he were lying there on the road. But he had compassion. This Samaritan had compassion on the wounded man. He bandaged his wounds. He put the injured man in his own, on his own donkey and took him to the town, checked him into the inn. Put it in today's terms, he put, applied first aid and put him in his nice new clean pickup, even though he probably got the seats bloody. Took him to the hospital and checked him in. Told the doctor, if, if he needs anything, just put it on my tab. Put it on my credit card. Then Jesus turned to the Jews who were listening to the parable and said, go and do likewise. This is the example that I set for you. If you want to be like, if you want to aim for perfection, help people who need help. 
In the same spirit, the Apostle Paul writes, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2. It's all throughout the Bible, this principle. So the first thing that we can strive to become is healers. And remember that words hurt and actions hurt. Yes, I realize that sometimes this may cost us something just as it costs the Good Samaritan. But oh, the rewards you will receive are eternal. And you will please God in being a healer. The second thing is being an encourager. In Romans 12, 6 through 8, lists seven gifts that God has given his children. Among them is the gift of encouragement. I honestly believe it belongs near the top of our list of traits that we need to cultivate as Christians. In Acts 4.36, Barnabas was called the son of encouragement. And he certainly and obviously had the traits of encouragement. He was an encourager. Do you remember Barnabas? He and Paul were selected by the Holy Spirit to become the first missionaries to share the good news about Jesus. They were going to go on the very first missions trip. Barnabas had a nephew named John Mark, and Barnabas brought John Mark with them on the trip. But as they traveled, John Mark turned back. We're not told why. Perhaps he was young and he got homesick, or maybe the journey was too tough. We, we don't know why he turned back. Whatever the reason, John Mark quit and returned home. And the Bible is clear in the fact that Paul took offense to it. Paul didn't like quitters. In fact, most people don't like quitters. But Paul didn't like this quitter named John Mark. After a few years, Paul and Barnabas were preach, plan, preparing, planning to go on a new missions trip, a second missions trip. Barnabas, again, wanted to take John Mark along, but Paul refused. He did not want to take a quitter along. So Paul and Barnabas decided to split their efforts to go on two mission trips, two separate teams. Barnabas would take John Mark, and Paul would choose a new partner, Silas. We do not hear about John Mark again until years later, near the end of Paul's life. Paul was in prison writing, to Timothy with instructions about coming to visit him. Timothy says, I'm going to come and visit you. And Paul says, this is what I want you to do. 1 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me here, he's telling Timothy. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Now this Mark was the same man, the same John Mark as before. Who knows what would have become of him if it hadn't been for the encouragement of Barnabas. But now Paul sees Mark in a different light. Some people seem to have the knack of showing you just where you went wrong, just what you did wrong. And others have the gift of encouragement, always encouraging you to do better, to try again. You can do it. We thank God for the encouragers in this life like Barnabas who keep us believing in ourselves, keep us believing that we can do it. They give us hope for the journey. They tell us we can do it. They never give up on us. They are heavy on compassion and ready with an encouraging hand up when we fall. That's the kind of people that we want to be. In today's world, it's easy to become discouraged and quit. Believe me, (laughs) I know what it feels like to be discouraged and quit. I, I look at our congregation today. We a lot less than we were this time last year. Because mainly because of the coronavirus, and some some of our saints have gone to heaven, unrelated. Look at the turmoil we have in our world, and every Sunday, God says, "Give them an encouraging word." Encouragement really helps. We need people who, most of all, are encouragers in our life. Who knows what shepherd, what sheep herder will become the giant killer like King David, or what church persecutor will become the great missionary like Paul. And if they do, if they make it, make it from sheep herder to giant killer or church persecutor to great missionary, part of the reason will be 
is there was an encourager in their life. Say, God loves you. You can do it. I don't care what mistake you made. Keep on keep it on. Pursue the goal. Aim for perfection. God still loves you. The third thing you can do, and it doesn't cost us anything, is learning to be a listener. A few years ago, a man placed an ad in the personal section of the newspaper, and it said, I will listen to your troubles, $20 per call, one hour time limit, and give my advice. He got lots of takers. And if this story is true, and it was presented as true, it shows how desperate people are to be heard. Do you ever feel like that you're really not being heard? That you talk and no one hears you? Nothing communicates love like taking the time to listen. When you listen to someone, when someone comes to you and they say, say I have problems, you say, well, tell me about it. And when they're done, you don't say, I'll I'll pray for you later. He said, let me pray for you now. That's being a good listener. Sometimes listening is the most powerful thing we can do. We never do anything. We never say anything. We just listen. A case in, in an example would be when, someone, when a spouse loses their husband or their wife or when a father or a mother loses a child. I can tell you no matter what you say to them, your words will not be adequate to loosen their pain. But by you being there and listening to them and loving them, you will communicate the love of God right into their lives. If you really want to do something that will help become a listener. Fourth, be a forgiver. The only person you really are ever going to hurt with unforgiveness is yourself. Most of the time, the person that you won't forgive is not even worried about what you're, you're unforgiving them for. Most of the time, they moved on, they've forgotten, and in your heart, you're unforgiving, and, and it's a poisoning festering in there, and it's poisoning your spiritual life, and the only person you hurt is yourself. Forgive people because they need it. Forgive people because you need it. Forgive people when they did it to you on purpose, and they are totally guilty. It doesn't matter what they did, how bad they were, you forgive them. Forgive your parents for failing to love you enough. Forgive your children for letting you down. Forgive your spouse. It's actually possible to forgive your spouse no matter what they've done. Peter thought he had forgiveness all figured out. In Matthew 18, 21 and 22, he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brothers when he sinned against me? Up to seven times? Peter's saying, look at me, Jesus. I'll forgive up to seven times. I got the right answer, don't I? Jesus answered not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, be a perpetual forgiver. Just forgive no matter how many times it takes. Don't keep count. If they need forgiveness, forgive them. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus was teaching on forgiving, and he gives, he gives a hard lesson. He, says, he said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. The crowning example of forgiveness is Jesus' words from the cross. In Luke 23, 24, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If, if, if you can find someone who has hurt you deeper than what we hurt Christ when we crucified the innocent Son of God, then you don't have to forgive them. I don't think you're going to find that. Those people did not deserve forgiveness, but the forgiveness is the example Jesus set on Calvary. So be a forgiver. Everyone needs to forgive the offended and the offender. And we've all played those parts. We've all been offended. And at one time or another, we've all offended someone. Amen? We need forgiveness. People need forgiveness. I've, I've told you before, and I'll say it again today. You're never more like Jesus than when you choose to forgive someone. If you want to aim at perfection, 
and become like Jesus, forgive. And the deeper the transgression you forgive, the more like Jesus you become. Amen? And like I said, if you can find someone who forgave you, who hurt you, wounded you more than what we wounded Jesus, then forgive them. Fifth, be a healer, helper. God's conversation with Moses in Exodus chapter 4 is a classic example of being a helper. The time arrived for the, to free the Jewish people from Egyptian slavery. God picked Moses to lead them out. But Moses was full of excuses. <laughs> well, they won't listen to me. I'm not a very good speaker. Sound like me 25 years ago. Please, someone, please send someone else. God reassured Moses of his divine help. He would be with Moses, but he also gave him Aaron as his personal helper for the task. He said, Aaron will go with you. He'll talk for you, and he'll help you. The result was the rescue of the nation of Israel, and through them, the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. Sometimes when we help, we don't know what we do. God always supplies the help we need when we are doing his work. If, if you're in the process of glorifying God, doing his work, and you need help, you need to ask because God will help you. The book of Nehemiah tells us of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. There were opposing forces that did not want the wall completed, but the walls were rebuilt despite the enormous obstacles. One of the keys to their success is found in the phrase in Nehemiah chapter 11, you hear it 11 times, it says, next to him. This man was working, and next to him, he had a helper. And next to him, he had a helper. And next to him, he had a helper. And the Bible lists helper after helper. Next to him, he had a helper. They helped each other. One took over where the other one left off. They stood stand by, side by side. Many hands make light work. And in this case, the helping provided fellowship, encouragement, security, and faith and hope. They completed the wall. So be a helper. Come alongside of someone. Offer a helping hand. Communicate the love of God. It's great to see that spirit in our churches. And I believe this church has it. We just need more people to have more of it. Amen? We need to all multiply ourselves. They, they say it's against the law of the clone, but if I could just clone you all a couple times, we'd be right where we need to be. I remember a year or two back, Rob was, we were in a board meeting, and Rob asked, the board, if we would be willing to take on rebuilding Dale's porch. And all the men in the church pitched in that day. We all agreed. And it, every man who was able-bodied, and even some who really weren't able-bodied, pitched in that day. And it was a long, hard, and hot day. We got there early, and we worked till late in the afternoon, and it was right in the middle of summer, and it was a, it was a hot day. You remember, don't you, Henry? <laughs> Those of you who were here remember. I never walk up those steps without hearing Dale tell me how much it meant to him to have the church come and rebuild that porch. The old porch would probably still be standing and been sufficient if we wouldn't have done nothing. But it was more than a porch to Dale. It was God meeting his need through the helping hands of the church. Dale never forgot it. The way to real joy is helping God's children who cannot help themselves. Amen? You want to help somebody? Find someone. Help them. And you'll be communicating the love of God to them in their life. Just let God have the glory. Sometimes we take the glory. Oh, I rebuilt the church the other day. It would have been something if we'd have come in that Sunday after we rebuilt the church. And I was there, and there's a lot of people who worked harder than me, and I would have stood up and said, well, I did it. I got the Dale's porch rebuilt. I would have been a liar. <laughs> I didn't get it rebuilt. God moved on people's hearts to rebuild that church, that porch. And we gave the glory to God. Six is to be a supporter. 
This is a lot like being an encourager, but it goes a step for, past that. Professional football teams are all pretty much alike, right? They hire the best coaches and the best players. They get their players from the same draft. On any given day, one team can beat any other team. Amen? That's the, what they say on any given Sunday. But there is one factor that helps teams win games. It is called home court advantage, home field advantage. Teams generally win more of their games at home than they do on the road. Now, really good teams win a lot in both home and away. And really bad teams win, lose a lot no matter where they're at. But most of the teams can win at home. They win more often at home. And even the New York Jets that only won one game this year, I think, they, they won. Any team can beat any other team. The fields are all the same size. The, the balls are all the same size. They got the same amount of air in them. The goals are the same distance apart. There's basically no difference from one field to another. The only difference is their supporters. Teams consistently win more games in front of their own fans. A fan is someone who stands by you, cheers you on to victory. Now, you know, we can get, we can go to a football game or a basketball game or a NASCAR race or a concert or whatever it might be, and we can go absolutely hysterical. Amen? You've seen it tomorrow, t tonight, if you watch the championship games or, not, or the whatever games were played tonight, some kind of playoff games, you'll see the fans going nuts. Oh! Too bad we couldn't get more excited about church every once in a while. Amen? I mean, some people think if you get a little too fanatic, you might embarrass yourself. Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's the way God sees it. And we shouldn't care about what anybody else thinks. There is power in the support of the home field advantage. Players say they can feel their fans' energy and feed off of it. It works that way for families and for churches, too. Hundreds, husbands and wives should be one another's greatest cheerleaders. You should cheer your wife or your husband on to greatness. Encourage them to be the most that they can be. Kids should know that their greatest fans are their parents. I've dealt with children who had heard so many times, I'm going to amount to nothing. My dad's told me a thousand times. And you want to know something? Those people, those children, will amount to less than what they would have, than if their parents would have told them a thousand times, you can do anything that you set your mind to, especially when you have Jesus helping you. All things are possible through, through, through God our Father. Kids should support their parents, too. What a difference it would make if everyone in the family and the church began to really support one another. Stronger, more Christ-like families build stronger, more Christ-like churches. Amen? We build these churches one brick at a time, one family at a time. Mike and Angela's family, Ernie's family, Elsie's family, all of our families, we're all a brick in the wall. And if we're Christ-like bricks, our church is going to be a Christ-like church. Finally, be a saver. You can save a lot of things, but I'm referring to bring, bringing the lost to Jesus. Do you remember Andrew's first action after meeting Jesus? It says that Andrew met Jesus, and the Bible says the first thing Andrew did was to bring his brother Simon to tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, John 1, 41 and 42. <laughs> he found the Messiah. You found the Messiah. He got excited about it. I hope you got excited about it. And he went and he got his brothers and whoever else would listen and said, come and see Jesus so you can be saved too. And that's exactly what our reaction should be. We should say, like I found the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Come, come, come to our church and see him. Meet him. Let us introduce you. And I know that sometimes it sounds... You know, like, well, I, I don't want to be too pushy. <laughs> you know, you remember as young, older people, we remember, I remember growing up being told there was two things you never talk about. Can anyone tell me what those two things are? 
Anyone? No. Politics and religion. We never talk about politics and religion, do we? Oh, well, over the last six months, that's all we talked about was politics. And all the left talks about how bad all the right is, and we hate each other, and, and, and yeah, we can talk about politics. You know, the whole, and religion, the only people who quit talking about religion were the Christians. We don't want to offend anybody. Oh, I wouldn't want to offend that poor person. I know they're not going to go to heaven. They'll probably end up in hell, but I don't want to offend him, telling him that Jesus loves him. How crazy is that? We need to be like Andrew. The first thing we should think when we meet someone who doesn't know Jesus is, let me introduce that person to Jesus. If, if they don't want to be your friend, so be it. Jesus said, if you go to a town and you're spreading the good news about me and they don't receive you, just shake off the dust and go someplace else. Don't let it offend you. Just, just keep going. You know, when I was in car sales, the guy told me, he said, the secret to car sales is not how good you talk. It's how many people you talk to. If you talk to one person, you're not going to sell any cars. But if you talk to 100 people, you're probably going to sell 30 cars. Because there's 100 people out there looking for cars, and you're going to get 2 or 3% of them. And it's the same way with Jesus. When, when we bring people to Jesus, we're not going to get them all. And you're not graded on how many actually receive the gospel because of what you did. You're graded on whether you bring people to Jesus. That's the, that's the test you want to pass. That's the perfection you want to aim for. Bringing people to Jesus and then just trusting Jesus to do everything else. And you know what? He's a pretty good guy. He, he usually gets it done. And he wanted his brother to be saved, so he brought him to Christ. Bringing another person to Jesus is the greatest experience you'll ever experience. And you won't experience all that experience until you meet them in heaven. And they come to you and say, you know what? I'm here because of what you did. Jesus will say, see this loved one? You never knew it. But because of what you did, they're here. Jesus left heaven, came to earth to reconcile people to God. And when he left, he said, now it's your turn. You reconcile people to God. You introduced them to Jesus. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 1910, Jesus instructs us in his last statement, he says. Now, you know, you heard of the deathbed statement, right? As a police officer, we were trained. If, if you're with a person and they're dying, what they say to you is admissible in court. Now, that's ne what people say is never admissible in court except for when they're dying. Because people think people tell the truth when they're dying. <laughs> You're getting ready to die. You better be telling the truth. <laughs> Jesus, his last statement says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus, with his last words, he says, he says, go and introduce people to me, and if you do, I will be with you always. You'll, whatever help you need, I'll be there to help you with. Whatever needs you have, I'll be there to help you with. When it comes time for you to find heaven, even though you don't know the way, I'll be there to help you. So thank of those you know who don't know Jesus as their Savior. Go to them, make it your business of bringing them to Christ and telling them about Jesus. All the things that we have talked about today, this morning, help us to bring people to Jesus. But none of them are more important than becoming a savior. You can't be anyone's savior, but you can save everyone. Amen? It's not always easy, but the rewards are eternal and Nothing pleases Jesus more than when we introduce a lost soul to him and that soul comes 
to Jesus. It says, Jesus, I've been wrong. I'm a believer now. I'm trusting in you. The Bible tells us that the angels rejoice in heaven and, and they have a party up there. One of these days we'll be part of those parties. I want to encourage you today to aim for per per perfection. Paul put it like this, Philippians 3.13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He wrote most of the New Testament. He was the most greatest missionary of all time. And he says, you know, brothers and sisters, I've not yet gotten it for myself. But the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what it is, he says, I don't care what's back there. Sin, goodness, being a great person, being a lousy person, it doesn't matter what's behind. We can't change that, but we can change our tomorrows. We can become a saver. We can lead people to Jesus. We can become like Christ. To know Christ is to be like Christ. He says, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And that's exactly the goal, heaven. Ain't it? Is that not why we love Jesus? We want to be with him in heaven. Jesus ain't in heaven. I want to go where Jesus is. But we're told he's in heaven, the right hand of the Father. And I want to go and be with Jesus when this life is over. The song that LaDonna sang this morning just all with, Nobody loves me like Jesus. It's so true. Amen? Amen? No one likes you, loves you like Jesus, and no one loves me like Jesus. Jesus loves us with a never-ending love. Thank God for his, for his goodness, for his love, for his sacrifice. I mean, we have so much to be excited about and so much to tell people. Don't ever let fear stand in your way of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? I know how it feels. Sometimes you think, well, I really don't want to do that. I, I don't. Had a guy come to me one time, and I've told this story, but I want to tell it again. Had a guy come to me, and he said, he said and, and he was a real, <laughs> he was something himself. But he said, I got this friend who, who ran off with my wife and, and stole, stole money from my business. And, and he, everybody hates him, and I hate him. But I read in the paper today, he's dying, and in the nursing home, he has cancer. He says, I want you to go save him, Pastor. And I said, well, you want me to go save him? I said, I, I can go and talk to him, but I can't save him, but we can lead him to Jesus. But I said, I, said I, told, I told him his name was Jerry. I said, Jerry, I'm not going without you. He says, if you want me to come, you have to go with me. And we, we went there, and we were in this big courtyard that was bigger than this, and there were people all around us. And we were sitting right in the middle at a little table. And I asked that guy, I said, you know, Jerry tells me about you. He says, he said, I got to be truthful. What Jerry tells me ain't too hot. He said, I said, I hear you have cancer and you're dying. He said, he said, sure enough, Pastor, I only got a little bit of time left is what the docs tell me. I said, well, do you think when you die, you're going to go to heaven? And he said, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. I said, well, would you die? Would you like to go to heaven? And he said, yes, Pastor, I would. And right there in front of all those people, we let that man to Christ. I believe he's in heaven today. I never saw him again. He died. Jesus did the hard part. All I did was say, there's Jesus. Do you believe in him? He said, I do. Don't let fear keep you from sharing the gospel. The government can tell you, oh, we don't talk about religion. You know, I worked at Kansas, University of Kansas Hospital, and they literally read us a letter to every employee and said, this year you will not say Merry Christmas at the hospital. You will say Happy Holidays. We don't speak about religion here. It's the law. Well, forget them. I went around telling everybody Merry Christmas. You know what? Just because the government tells us not to do it, or society tells us not to do it, or it's not popular with our culture, who cares? 
The only thing that's important is people either meeting Jesus or not. Amen? Don't ever let fear keep you from doing what Jesus wants you to do. Fear is not faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Charge headlong. Aim at perfection. Be as much like Jesus as you can be. And one day you will be with him in heaven. Amen? That, that's the gospel. You be like Jesus in every way you know, and one day you will be with him. That's a promise. It's not my promise. It's God's promise. Let's close in prayer. And everybody remember Sherry this week. I, I, from what I understand, she'll probably go to heaven this week. And we're going to go over and see her right when we're done here. She needs our comfort and our prayers. Let's close in prayer. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we love you today. You're such a good father. You have provided everything we need and so much more. You bless us in so many ways. We thank you this morning and we lift your name high. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to aim for perfection, to be like you, to be courageous and fear not and Become, help each one of us to become a savior, Lord. Help each one of us to lead someone to Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if they come to this church. We would like that, but it doesn't matter. The only thing that really counts is people coming to know you. And for all that you do, Lord, we love you and praise you. We pray that you go with us this week. Those families who really need you, I pray, Lord, that you would be with them and comfort them. And for all that you do, we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. I hope that was a blessing.